The, the other issue people are concerned about is saturated fat. I'm particularly in the context of Alzheimer's, an you know, APOE4 gene, which is a gene that may increase your risk of Alzheimer's. Well, it does, depending on how many copies you have and so forth. Is, is this something we should be worried about? I mean, bulletproof coffee and everybody. Yeah, let's let's uh, cover of Time magazine says eat butter. Like, what what's the deal here? Butter is back, and let's uh, take that apart a little <clears> bit, <throat> unpack that just uh, for your viewers to be really clear that there are some genes that help increase a person's risk for Alzheimer's, and one of them is this so-called APOE4 allele, and you can learn about it by having an at-home genetic test that anybody can do, and. 20% of Americans will carry the APOE4 allele. One copy. One copy. And some carry two copies, mm. which is uh, clearly associated with as much as a 12-fold increased risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. The APOE genes are involved in the production of apolipoproteins. And that's a, a big term, but it has to do with proteins in the body that carry fat, deliver fat, uh, to where uh, to where those fats might mm -hmm. be needed. Mm -hmm. and there is some indication that the benefits of saturated fat for the brain, we'll talk about that in just a moment, and even the benefits of a ketogenic diet, and we'll talk about that as well. I guess I'm putting a lot of things on the plate it's here. okay, we, we got it. We got okay. Time. We might gonna, be a little long here. We might have to add another uh, memory card. <laughs> um, but that are those things are less beneficial in the APOE4 carriers, meaning that they're not going to gain as much benefit directly from ketogenic diet or a diet that's higher in saturated fat. Uh, having there, is there harm? Uh, doesn't look like there's harm. Uh, and that said, uh, I think that there are benefits that everybody gains that I believe, if there is some sense of harm, would offset those uh, potential issues, which are very minimal mm -hmm. to begin with. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, what the <coughs> benefits are from consuming saturated fat is uh, the types that we recommend, MC2 oil, coconut oil, uh, the saturated fat that's found in eggs, for example. The benefits uh, are, are that we enhance our body's ability to produce these important chemicals that are called ketones. There's this huge interest these days all over the internet and certainly uh, in various venues for lectures, etc., in what is called the ketogenic yeah, diet. Yeah, like the number one diet books You bet, are and with good reason. Diets. And it's, it's a brand new phenomenon for humans. It's only the type of diet we've been on for a couple million years. Mm -hmm. So Cyclical, we, on and off of it. Right. But we've been in and out of ketosis for a long, long time. So it's got a heck of a track record. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we can talk about that. But basically, it's a diet that counters inflammation, that enhances energy production, that activates this BDNF gene pathway to create more of that growth hormone to grow new brain cells, mm -hmm. that helps... Uh, reduce the production of free radicals, that helps get rid of damaged energy producers called mitochondria, that helps us with our ability to rid our bodies of cells, for example, that are damaged. So in multiple arenas, being on a ketogenic diet is really a good thing. Mm. So I think that the ability of the coconut oil and the MCT oil to, to make that happen really is very, very powerful. And there's data that's showing that those actually help improve out, outcomes in Alzheimer's patients. There's actually a data that indicates <clears throat> interventionally that simply using MCT oil improves cognitive function yeah. in established Alzheimer's patients. And what did I just say? There's data that shows that a nutritional intervention is effective in turning dementia around. Yeah. There's yeah. also data from Iran uh, that demonstrates that probiotic intervention demonstrates improvement on the mini mental status test, which is a standardized test doctors use in the office to determine how well a person's brain is functioning. It's impressive. I just, I just reviewed a book uh, by the new head of the Lou Ruo Center at Cleveland Clinic, which is the Alzheimer's research program there. And I was shocked to read, he talked about using ketogenic diets in patients with Alzheimer's as a way of treating the problem, which is pretty radical. You've got the head of a major academic medical center saying, yes, we can use food as medicine. We're, we're seeing this trend. Food as medicine, who knew? And yet there's this incredible backlash um, about this. We're going to get into that in a minute. Uh, there was an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association called The Rise of Pseudo-Medicine 
for dementia and brain health. And you and I would be considered in the pseudo-medicine quack category. I think I, 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 for me, it's a personal badge of honor that I'm on quack watch. Me too. <laughs> Along with most of our best friends. <laughs> but the saturated fat thing, I just want to come back to you. And the, the, the founder of quack watch commented on this article in JAMA. Yes, you need to see I, that. I'm sure. I'm sure. I feel like I'm doing a good job when I get more people attacking me, uh, from, from, you know, certain categories of like Monsanto and the farm yeah. industry. And, uh, but the saturated fat thing is fascinating because I want to be able to hear that saturated fat is not necessarily bad, that it is something that can be helpful in many conditions, but that's with one big caution is to avoid what I call sweet fat. And the reason that saturated fat, I believe, causes, and I want to hear your opinion on this, causes problems in the research, which can correlate saturated fat with disease like heart disease and other problems, is that when those studies were done, they're done in the context of people eating saturated fat in a high starch sugar diet. I call that sweet fat. Think of donuts, french fries, ice cream, cookies. These are high fat, high sugar combos that are yes. deadly. So the caution is if you're going to eat saturated fat, you can't eat a diet high in starch and sugar. Yes, high in carbohydrates, right? Plant foods. I always say 75% of your diet should be plant foods in terms of starch uh, not in terms of starch, in terms of vegetables. In fact, most of your diet should be plant foods by volume, but they have very little calories, and most of your calories should be fat, but it's not much volume. Can you comment on that? Yeah, sure. And I, and I would say, let, let's even take this, unpack this further. And uh, it doesn't even have to be in, the, in uh, relationship to eating uh, carbohydrates, uh, simple carbohydrates. Because the data comes from these studies that look at calculating the amount of saturated fat in somebody's diet based upon the foods that they eat. Then they calculate, well, the, this person eats uh, you know, a bunch of beef, they eat a bunch of bacon, et cetera, they get a lot of saturated fat. Well, as we talked about earlier, th those are the wrong kinds of foods for many, many reasons. Mm -hmm. So this is a calculated determination of saturated fat. It's not a biochemical demonstration that saturated fat does something in the body. Mm -hmm. It's people who <clears throat> ate a diet higher in saturated fat, which delivers lots of toxins because these are, the mod these are foods from animals that have been fed, as we said earlier, garbage. That's where those saturated fats, how they're delivered to the human body. Mm -hmm. So it's not a clean type yeah. of study. Right. It, where, it doesn't yeah. relate to telling a person to take a tablespoon of organic coconut oil. No relationship whatsoever. Look. 50% of the fat in human breast milk is saturated fat. Yeah. Saturated wait fat. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So basically, breast milk is almost as much saturated fat as pure butter. You bet. And why is it there? Because it helps for brain development, helps for immune system development. It helps prime I the. I thought it was 25%. 50%. 50%. It's of the fat. Of it, the fat. It, it helps but prime. But 25% of the calories in breast milk is from saturated fat. Yeah. And who we're knew? told to get less than 5%. By the American Heart Association. So, according to the American Heart Association, we should ban breastfeeding. Uh, I think it needs a label. They need to go around and stamp <laughs> breasts all around the world, saying uh, this High is not heart health. Fat. Yeah, <laughs> avoid this. I mean, you know, it but, wasn't long ago when we were told not to eat avocado, avocados or nuts. Yes because they had high levels of the dreaded fat. That was about the worst, and, and we know where that came from now. We know how medical literature in the late 1960s was tainted by <clears throat> industry, by sugar, uh, who wanted, who influenced what was published in the New England Journal yes. of Medicine, as recently revealed in the Journal of the American Medical Association and uh, ended up on the front page of the New York mm. Times. Yeah. And, you know, doctors bought into that. We bought into what our journals were telling us, yeah. and it was patently wrong. It's now you bring up a, a journal article from the Journal of the American Medical Association that is castigating uh, our approaches to dealing with brain health, calling it pseudoscience. Mm. We began pseudo our medicine. pseudo medicine. We began our conversation today with a discussion of the uh, publication in the same journal, I'll have you know, in November of this year wherein it was revealed that the so-called Alzheimer's drugs that this article is a proponent of yes. uh, don't work, but actually make people worse. Worse. Which is the pseudomedicine? Exactly. <laughs> well, I think, you know, part of the problem is that, you know, our type of medicine has not had the funding 
to study these interventions. Nobody's funding dietary interventions because they're expensive, they take a long time. Nobody's looking at these complex systems approaches to treating dementia, which you and I have done for decades. It's not just treating one thing. Like our friend Dale talks about medicine, maybe there's 36 different problems or 54 or 12. And if you don't deal with all of them, you're not going to get better. And our colleague and, and mentor, Sid Baker, says if you're standing on a tack, it takes a lot of aspirin to make it feel better. And if you're standing on two, taking one tack out doesn't make you 50% better, right? <laughs> so if you have mercury poisoning and gluten sensitivity and you just deal with the gluten, the mercury still might be a problem and you don't get better. And I think that's a really important lesson. And I think these, this article is very disturbing to me because it didn't really analyze the data behind it. And there's so much data behind the kinds of things we're doing, whether it's optimizing our diet or exercise or restoring sleep or meditation or using nutritional support, which is, you know, the B vitamins and methylation or getting rid of mercury or fixing the microbiome or balancing hormones. These are the things that we use in Constellation to help optimize brain function. And, and what we know is that these things work. I mean, the only study that's ever been shown at, at a scale to reverse or slow cognitive decline is called the finger study, which was basically using multiple interventions, diet, exercise, stress reduction, addressing risk factors for the heart, for example, and some resistance. And, and therein yeah, lies the criticism. Yes, but better. therein lies the criticism because <clears throat> the notion of leveraging multiple inputs into a system <clears throat> and looking for an outcome is uh, absolutely at, at odds with the current model of how science as it relates to medicine is carried out. Um, you mentioned Dr. Bredesen has a new book coming out where he actually reviews uh, case studies of reversing al Alzheimer's disease. And uh, uh, I had the opportunity to write the forward for that book. Yeah. And I talked about how this is unprecedented, uh, that he is not looking at what we call monotherapy to find the golden... Single drug for That can be disease, monetized. Right. You know, it's, uh, and yet he's looking at using multiple, but getting a great result. So why would we argue with that? But, you know, it is an inconvenient truth for people who want to believe otherwise that we need to create single approaches monotherapy and that can be the home run billion dollar product that makes mm -hmm. the investors very happy. Well it's exciting maybe you'd be excited to hear that I'm working with some of the top scientists at Cleveland Clinic talking about how do we study these systems approaches? How do we break the paradigm? How do we actually design a trial where we can test this theory and instead of calling it pseudomedicine, calling it the future of medicine, which is really what it is. So I have to say that uh <clears throat> As I get older, I'm less offended by these. Yeah. And I, I really uh, find it to be almost compl complimentary. Com it, it's sort of like complimentary medicine because uh, to be uh, the outlier and to be, um, you know, disruptive, I think is really a good thing these days mm -hmm. because the status quo is not where we want it to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to ch challenge the status quo and it's why people call us out. Mm -hmm. It's why, you know, you appear on the various videos and so do I and some people put a thumbs down and comment, well, you know, I read the China study and it said we should all, we shouldn't, you know, it's great. People want to believe yeah. because it's an inconvenient truth to tell somebody you need to stop drinking diet drinks you need to stop eating as much sugar as you're eating because it's going to compromise your health. Most people don't want to hear that message. Mm -hmm. They'd rather, as I mentioned earlier, hope for the magic bullet. As it relates to <coughs> Alzheimer's, it's interesting that in February of 2018, one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer, gave up. Gave up, yeah. A lot of companies. We're not going to chase down the magic bullet for Alzheimer's anymore because it's not. It doesn't have a, a good enough ROI. I mean, return there's literally on been hundreds of studies, billions of dollars spent going down this rabbit hole that is the wrong strategy for identifying the risks, the causes, and the treatments for cognitive decline or Alzheimer's. It's pretty stunning. And everybody's failing. And now people are starting to pay attention to what we're doing. I have a slide that I'll show you uh, at a conference you and I will be attending uh, in a couple of days. And it's really quite interesting because it shows it measures a group of people uh, in, in terms of insulin resistance, whether they have insulin resistance, which is the consequence of diet or not. Over time, who collects the most beta amyloid, this pro sticky protein in the brain that is associated with Alzheimer's risk? Who collects more beta amyloid? Uh, and it's dramatic how much more amyloid is in the brains of people who are insulin resistant. The reason I mentioned it in the context of our discussion right now is because the amyloid in the brain has really been the focus of the pharmaceutical industry trying to create an Alzheimer's drug. Amyloid does or doesn't play a role, whatever, but... Sort of like sticky toffee that comes up right, in the brain. Right, but, but 
developing drugs to get rid of amyloid or to keep it from forming in the first place has been the focus of billions of dollars of research. Because if you could get rid of that protein, you'd, that might cure Alzheimer's. It doesn't. But the point is that uh, we can determine on the front end how to lower our risk for de uh, developing amyloid in the brain in the first place. It's a reaction to something. It's a, it's, it is. It's something it, that's driving inflammation. That's right. It's an overreaction. It's an overreaction to infection, for example, to herpes simplex virus, to chlamydia, to various uh, organisms that do, in fact, colonize the, the brain. The microbiome of the brain. We there is a microbiome on the brain, of the brain. And in fact, in a book we have coming out, there's a title, uh, I mean, a chapter dedicated to that from Dr. Tansy's group yes. at Harvard. Yes, So it is really uh, quite incredible to realize uh, another uh, uh, slide, uh, series of slides looks at the degree of brain shrinkage if you carry the Alzheimer's gene in comparison to the degree of brain sh uh, shrinkage in one year uh, plotted <clears throat> against your hemoglobin A1C or your average blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the rate of shrinkage of your brain is greater with a higher A1C than it is carrying the Alzheimer's gene. Yeah. And you can't change. That's pretty frightening. You can't change the Alzheimer's gene. You, if you got it, you've got it. You can change the expression of the gene. Though. You can, but you can sure as heck lower your A1C by simply making some dietary changes. Yeah, low sugar, starch. You bet. More uh, carbohydrates in the form of fiber. And more good fats. Nurturing your gut bacteria, reducing inflammation. But again, that is the inconvenient truth people don't want to embrace. Mm. The ball is very much on your side of the net. It's not up to me on the other side of the net, yeah. the doctor, to fix this. Yeah. It's up to you to hit that ball appropriately with some mm. topspin so that I can't <laughs> return it. You know, give it a good shot. Yeah. Here And here's how to do it. How? Lower your consumption of simple carbohydrates. Yeah. Eat more healthful fat. Eat more dietary fiber. Exercise. Mm. Make sure that your sleep is restorative. Really important, very yeah. much underrated. We spend a third of our lives sleeping or trying to True. sleep. And we recognize that so much is going on during that activity, which we used to think is simply passive, but that we understand that this is hugely involved in reducing inflammation, in enhancing the brain's ability to take the garbage out mm -hmm. through the activity of mm -hmm. the glymphatic system, mm -hmm. to triage that's, our that's daily... the lymph system of the brain, David talked about, the exactly. lymphatic system, and, and, which uh, has to work at night. And it works at night. It's got the night shift. the garbage out of your brain. So that you're ready to go the next day. And to triage our day-to-day uh, -day experiences and put them where they will be meaningful for us to rely upon in terms of leveraging new information to make decisions, so so, I so under under uh, underrated. I want to come back to something we were talking about before because I think it, it, we kind of glossed over it, which is this study on the low carbohydrate versus high carbohydrate diets and what it showed and what it didn't show, and and challenging the very notion of grain brain, which is that we should be eating a low starch sugar diet. When I looked at that study, and I, I actually am giving a talk at this conference called "The Failure of Nutrition Science." And Tomorrow policy. you are. Tomorrow, yeah. At ten fifteen. At ten fifteen, which will not be when this podcast is airing. <laughs> no, but, this is evergreen. <laughs> but the the uh, extraordinary thing is when you start to dig a little bit. The headlines were low carbohydrates kill people. They're not safe. And everybody reads the headline and go, okay, it's science. It's published in a major journal. It's top Harvard scientists. It must be true. But when you actually look at the data, first of it's a population study, which doesn't prove anything. It just shows a correlation, yes or no. You know, I wake up every morning and the sun comes up 100% of the time. That means that if, if Mark, Mark doesn't wake up, the, the sun sun's not going to come that's up. That's right. So <laughs> they're correlated 100%, but there's no correlation I noticed of cause and effect. I that whenever it's people's windshield wipers are going, it's <laughs> yeah. raining. Yeah, obviously the windshield wipers make it rain. Absolutely, absolutely. But what was fascinating about the studies when you look a little bit deeper, first it wasn't really low carbohydrate. The low carbohydrate group was thirty eight percent carbs, yeah, that's which right. is not low carbohydrate. And second, when they did the t the study, it was thousands of people, tens of thousands of people over twenty five years. They gave them two questionnaires separated by six years of what did you eat last week, and People actually don't tell the truth. It's well documented. In fact, in this study, the average caloric intake was 1,500 calories. Now, the average person eats about 2,000, 2,200 calories. 
Where are the other 700 calories? Could, could have been all sheet cake, and we don't know yeah. what they were eating. So the study, you know, may be suggestive of certain things, but it's really not proving anything. And people get all caught up in the headlines and don't really look at critically at the studies. And that's part of the problem. So I, I had a similar experience recently <clears throat> when uh, a study came out, and the headlines were a gluten-free <clears throat> diet increases risk of heart attack. All you gluten-free people, you're Ooh. all going to die of a heart attack. Yeah. And again, Harvard researchers, and uh, I had to respond to this, and the answer is, read the study. Yeah. And what the study showed was that people who adopt a gluten-free diet, by and large, have much less dietary fiber. They don't yeah. know what's gluten and what isn't gluten, so they're eating less they're dietary eating fiber. they're eating gluten-free cake and cookies. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and what the authors commented on in, the, in their conclusion was, uh, that they fully recognized that there was less fiber consumption in the gluten-free group. It had nothing to do with, but the, the way they spun the article was that gluten was a toxin. Yeah. You know, uh, and uh, it was, it was. Uh, I mean, going gluten-free was somehow toxic. Toxic, right. And that, and you wonder, how could avoiding something make it a toxin yeah. in the first place? It's but, very confusing. It, but, like but the headlines get spun you know, case in point, what you have here, the pseudo medicine, my goodness. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty exciting where we're at in terms of the brain. And I think that you've clearly been out ahead of this for decades. Um, in, in terms of the, the newer ideas around, um, fasting and intermittent fasting and fasting mimicking diets, there's a lot of noise about this and ketogenic diets are part of that, that spectrum, which is like a fasting state. When we don't eat, we get ketogenic. And when we eat a high fat, low starch diet, we get ketogenic. So um, what is the utility of these? What do you think about these things? Is this really where we should be going? And what are the differences? First, I'll, I'll say that, you know, the beauty of this coming into the forefront, which it really is right now, uh, at least we think so, because we're seeing it day in and day out, is that these are approaches that emulate our ancestors. Uh, meaning that our ancestors had times of caloric scarcity and that would do things to their physiology that would allow them to survive. And that's a very important <clears throat> fundamental premise because it plays into uh, the gene activation uh, part of that story, it plays into why uh, researchers like Dr. Walter Longo, I know you're going to interview him, um, why they're getting really incredible results across a huge spectrum of our modern day maladies, be yeah. it cancer, uh, heart disease and even dementia. So they're treating the root causes of all of them. Yes. Be, well, you're and you're harvesting uh, pathways that lead to good gene expression. You're tinkering with uh, the expression of the life code in a positive way, uh, and offloading some of the negative expression of DNA that would have otherwise happened based upon how people were otherwise eating. So there are. Uh, first of all, there's a term. Uh, um, intermittent fasting, which I think is a, is clearly a bit nebulous. Does that mean fasting for a couple days every every month, or does it mean just deciding not to have breakfast till noon? Time restricted eating. Yeah, it, it's so. well, it's actually uh, that's a little bit different. We'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. But it, you know, when we have our last meal in the evening, there's a period of time that we don't eat generally, unless we're getting up in the middle of the night and hit the refrigerator. But that Which time, people do. <laughs> and Klein Levin syndrome is one. Uh, <laughs> don't don't ask me. Um, uh, but people go to sleep. They wake up in the morning, and then that first meal is called the break fast. You break your fast, and if you can protract the time till you do that, then your body will indeed produce more and more of these chemicals we talked about earlier that are good for us, called ketones. So protracting that, I find until maybe noon, one or two o'clock, I think is a good thing. I knew you were coming today, so I didn't eat breakfast. Well, I did, because I, I don't think it's, I think it may well be the, uh, I thought it was going to be the only meal I was going to have today, but turns out that, that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, typically what I, if you must know, what I do at home is I don't eat until about, uh, about one o'clock or sometimes two o'clock or sometimes not at all, or sometimes just the evening meal. And people wonder, well, how do you function? Uh, I function really well, as a matter of fact. I mean, I may add to that a little bit of MCT oil just to get my ketones a little bit higher. Yeah. So um, the uh, fasting mimicking diet that you will obviously learn more about when you uh, interview the, the person credited with inventing that, Dr. Walter Longo, is a technique to gain the activation of the genes, the positive aspects of this approach, while at the same time making it more tolerable, tolerable and available to so people. So it's like eating uh, 
800 to 1100 calories a day, which puts your body into a semi-starvation state that activates all these anti-aging reparative mechanisms. And and let me just say uh, that the other thing that fasting does that I think is underrated but nonetheless really important is that it it uh, enhances a sense of gratitude, which I think is hugely important. When you realize suddenly that you've taken food for granted in our society, we mm-hmm. all do that mm-hmm. because it's plentiful. But when you're not eating and for a day or two, and you suddenly realize that, wow, we live in a time when I can eat when I want to, mm-hmm. it it raises your sense of gratitude, and that through what we talked about earlier, the rewiring of the brain, the more gratitude that you experience in your life, the more it wires your brain into the gratitude center. Yeah, it's powerful. So I, part of the, the theory of the fasting mimicking diet, if I want to get into that for a little bit, because it is confusing even for me, someone who's been studying this forever, the different opinions. You know, he's no saturated fat. He's very low protein, no animal protein. Um, and the theory is that saturated fat is inflammatory and promotes aging. Uh, and he's found this in mouse models. In mouse model, yes. Which may be certain kind of mice and does it apply to humans and what do we mean? And then he also talks about the role of protein activating a particular pathway. It's called mTOR, mTOR. which is an, in, in a protein that, um, that, that actually can cause, the protein actually causes activation of this pathway that seems to lead to accelerated aging. So he's saying no animal protein and that we should eat a low protein diet uh, and that the fasting mimicking diet is extremely low protein. How do you reconcile that with the rest of sort of the science of what we know around protein and aging? In fact, he even, he even suggests that as we get older, we need more protein. So I'd say, first of all, that uh, we have to always keep an open mind that uh, my position on animal protein has changed over the years and will likely continue to change. I eat less and less of it. I eat more of a plant-based diet for many reasons, not just with respect to my health. Uh, but beyond that, there are two sides to the mTOR story, as you well know. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you, um, Rhonda Patrick, I think, has done a terrific job in talking about the upsides of mTOR in terms of building muscle mass. Yeah. So well, it um, activates when you exercise. Exactly. Which we know is a great thing. So I would say that uh, we have to keep an open mind, and these are still some unanswered questions that we are going to leave on the table. We're not going to be uh, dogmatic and say it's this way and a story, but rather we will need to study it further. Yeah. The broad strokes are more dietary fiber, less uh, simple carbohydrates, and changing the quality of the fat that we eat. I think those are nothing's indelible, but I think you know those are important bullet points that if we could just get that message across, that's really uh, very very fundamental. The other lifestyle issues that we talked about earlier, uh, I think, are important as well. Uh, But, you know, we have to really respect a researcher like Dr. Longo. Uh, And then a a caution uh, would be to recognize that we cannot always extrapolate from the mouse model to humans directly. Though we do it a lot, I do it a lot. Uh, but, you know, for example, the glymphatic system was demonstrated, we talked about it earlier, the clearing of the brain during sleep, if they were able to get the rodents to sleep on their left side. Does that mean people <laughs> should sleep on their left side? I don't See, think do so. I sleep on my left side? No, I sleep on my right side, usually. <laughs> but, you know, maybe there's Uh-oh. some knowledge there. But, uh, again, so we will follow the work of, of a terrific researcher like Dr. Longo and, and watch what he comes up with. I mean... You know, with a person as dedicated as he is, yeah. uh, he deserves uh, a lot of attention. Yeah, it's extraordinary to look at, you know, the work. Because the question is always compared to what, right? Things can be looked at in isolation and seem to be good or bad. But when you actually look at comparing things to other things, what do you find? I mean, you can find, for example, that a plant-based diet is much better in creating better outcomes than a, uh, than a diet that's a typical American diet. Even a low-fat vegan diet is far better than a typical processed American diet, right? That is not a surprise. But what about comparing a vegan diet that's low-fat to a, for example, a paleo diet that's very high in starch from carbohydrates that are good, like the 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 vegetables, right? And higher in fat and a little more animal protein and see what happens comparing the biology of these things. How do they affect 
the aging process. It's very fascinating. One of the things that I found challenging with Dr. Longo, and I'm going to chat with him about this, is that he says, yes, even a low-carbohydrate diet will lose, will you lose weight, you'll change all the biomarkers of diabetes and then some resistance, but that doesn't matter because it promotes aging. It activates all the aging mechanisms. And Great I, conversation to have. Yeah. Uh, a thought that comes to mind that maybe you'll bring this up with him, and that is, you know, in a, in a sense, uh, his fasting mimicking uh, diet program uh, kind of uh, is, uh, uh, resembles Dr. Bredesen's approach mm -hmm. in that uh, he's incorporating this program into cancer therapy where people are receiving chemotherapy, for yeah. example. Yeah. Uh, much as Dr. Thomas Seyfried uh, and wrote The Metabolic Basis of Cancer, talked about using a ketogenic diet uh, in correlation, uh, I mean, in, in along with, with chemo. conjunction with uh, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, yeah. and even surgery, but doing your best to avoid steroids if possible. Mm. So not that the fasting mimicking diet is the end all, nor is a ketogenic diet, right. as Dr. Seyfried describes the end all, but could be looked upon as adjuncts to amplify the effectiveness in a more comprehensive yeah. way of more standardized uh, approaches. If you love that last video, you're gonna love the next one. Check it out here. Weight gain is really not controlled by energy in, energy out, calories, calories in, calories in, calories out. It was really controlled by hormones. The thing about nutrition science is, you know, the food industry is huge and they have a stake in what nutrition science says.